Good afternoon, everyone, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to our webinar on direct support for those harmed by fracking. Uh, we're really happy and excited that you've all chosen to join us today for this really important conversation, and uh, thanks so much for taking the time out to join us. Um, the Halt the Harm Network serves to connect in th the thousands of people who are working to halt the harm caused by fracking across the country. And this national network brings together people to share ideas, resources, and actively identifying areas where people need support and are looking within the network itself to promote collaboration and find solutions. So who are Halt the Harm Network leaders? Leaders in the network are individuals actively working and collaborating to help those living in communities negatively impacted by fracking. A leader can be anyone from, for example, an executive director for a large conservation nonprofit that works nationally, um, all the way to a concerned parent whose kid goes to a school that's perhaps only a half mile from a drilling site and who's organized other parents at that school. We recognize that Halt the Harm's definition of a leader is broad, but that's primarily due to the fact that we also recognize that every small act counts in this movement, no matter who you are. Some of you listening today may already be a leader, but if you're not yet one and feel that you qualify, you're in luck. By signing up for this webinar, you will receive an invite to apply as a leader. To take advantage of these services, we really do highly recommend you to apply as a leader and directly connect with today's speakers, who um, are also all leaders. Now, by signing up as a leader, one of the great resources you'll get exclusive access to is our leader directory. The this, this directory is already more than 90 people strong with profiles built by leaders across the country from over 15 different states. Although individual, through individual profiles, you can directly message leaders. Um, you can check out what they're doing in their home states or nationwide and find them on social media as well. Uh, the only way that you can access this great service is by becoming a Halt Harm leader, but once you do become a leader, the access is free. Um, we also love highlighting the great things that uh, our leaders are doing with the rest of the network. This webinar is a great example of how we're hi highlighting leaders' work, but we also send out leader profiles, which you can see on the screen here, um, an example shown here where we did a brief profile on Ed Fallon, an early leader of ours who recently walked hundreds of miles along a proposed pipeline in his home state of Iowa to bring awareness to the pipeline and its harms. Another example of a leader-exclusive service is campaign support. If you have a campaign idea, we can support that and drive more supporters to your list by providing digital campaign support. Um, we just wrapped up a campaign supporting another leader, Adam Garber, from Penn Environment, in collecting over 2,000 comments to send to the Pennsylvania DEP during an open public comment period they had on waste pits. Um, you know, if you have something you want to drive public support to and you want to build your list at the same time, make sure to sign up as a leader to access val this valuable resource and be happy to you know, find a way that we can collaborate and help support you on this. A big reason behind our push to recruit more leaders like you to our network is that we really do believe leaders who are doing amazing work in their local communities can drive change on a national level when networked. The idea is as more leaders join the network, we will work with you to identify advocacy opportunities and help support you develop uh, and execute and manage these campaigns. Through these campaigns, supporters will be generated that will grow the base in the network and will also add to a growing list that will be shared with those leaders and further increase their capacity for outreach and engagement. Now, um, for the real reason why you guys are all here, which is to introduce today's speakers who, uh, like I mentioned before, are also Halt the Harm leaders, and they'll be presenting some really exciting work happening in Pennsylvania, ground zero of the fracking industry in their state. We have Stephanie Novak, community organizer at Mountain Watershed Association, talking about their direct support fund. We have Bridget Shields, founding member and outreach organizer for Friends of the Harmed, talking about their publication, Shalefield Stories. And last but not least, we have Karen Faraden from Burke's Gas Truth to talk about local stand. So how this webinar is going to work, just a quick uh, a few quick housekeeping guidances for today before we get started. Um, each of our panelists will pre present for approximately 15 minutes. Um, and the audience, you all can submit questions during the con uh, using the control panel on your screen. We will address as many questions as we can following the speaker presentation. So if you've got anything, make sure to um, chat us your questions. 
And also this webinar is going to be recorded and made available online at halttheharm.net slash direct support. Now that we've got that out of the way, we'll start with Stephanie from Mountain Watershed Association. Take it away, Stephanie. Thank you for having me on the webinar today to provide information about the Direct Support Fund. Uh, my name is Stephanie Novak, and I am the community organizer for Mountain Watershed Association, which is home of the Okagini Riverkeeper. Uh, just to give you a little background on MWA, we're a nonprofit environmental organization whose mission is to protect, preserve, and restore the Indian Creek and Greater Yakutani River watershed. We have seen environmental and community rights impeded upon by boom and bust fossil fuel industries. And currently, one of the greatest threats to the health of our watersheds and quality of life in the communities that we serve is shale gas development. MWA is providing direct support to communities facing impacts from this industry in a number of different ways. Uh, the first is through our Marcellus Citizen Stewardship Project, which allows us to offer guidance and resources to help organize residents. We do this by educating the public about environmental and community impacts that result from the extraction, transportation, and processing of natural gas. By identifying community leaders, we build capacity for outreach and organizing, along with uh, water and air monitoring activities. So we launched the Direct Support Fund back in August of 2014 to help cover some of the costs that are associated with building a grassroots effort. Through an easy and uh, application and reporting process, funds are available to individuals, groups, and organizations that are working in their communities to fight uh, the impacts of shale gas development. So on your screen now, you'll see a list of some things that we will consider uh, proposals for. And those include things like mailings and newsletters, yard signs, social media and website development, advertising, things like newspaper banner ads, um, those types of things, hosting community educational meetings or events, and hosting fundraising events. And of course, you know, there are many uh, more examples that are not listed here. And we really like to see uh, different projects that are kind of thinking outside of the box. Um, so to date, we've provided support to over 40 projects on both small and large scales. And some of the more elaborate projects that we've funded include things like the Great March for Climate Action, Energy Justice, Shale Convergence, um, and Shale Field Stories, which Bridget will be telling you more about a little bit later here in the webinar. Now, all of these projects are, were intended to have a, a very broad audience to increase awareness about the harms of fracking on both a statewide and, and even a national level. So there's no doubt that we've accomplished this, as our completion reports estimate that over 100,000 people have been reached by projects funded through direct support. And probably one of the most far-reaching projects that we've funded so far is the Great March for Climate Action, where activists walked 3,000 miles from California to Washington, um, raising awareness about climate change. And in Pennsylvania, the marchers joined with anti-fracking activists to hold rallies throughout the state, focusing on how the natural gas industry is contributing to the climate crisis. Ed Fallon, uh, founder of the March, recently walked 400 miles along the Bakken oil pipeline and is documenting his experiences to share with the public. Um, so I encourage you to visit his blog on the Halt the Harm to read more about his journey. Uh, we've also funded projects with a much more narrow focus, which can still have a significant impact on communities. And one specific example of this is when a handful of residents in Penn Township received funds from the Direct Support Project to send a letter to homeowners to let them know that they were in a half a mile radius of a proposed well pad. And as a result of this mailing, community members had advance notice about the development that was set to occur in their community, and they were able to organize against it. Um, so residents ended up forming the citizens group Protect PT, which is um, the picture that you'll see on the screen there with Jillian and Siobhan, and uh, Jillian's two kids in that picture as well. And so now they're working uh, to raise community awareness. They're communicating with local elected officials. And they're currently legally challenging uh, shale gas development in their neighborhood. For the full story on how direct support has helped protect PT uh, to grow, 
I would encourage you to also check out my blog on Help the Harm Network as well. And just for more information about the Direct Support Fund, um, visit our website, mcwatershed.com, and under Learn More Direct Support. Um, tomorrow, June 25th, will actually be our last round of considerations with the possibility of extending that deadline if any funds remain or if we're able to secure additional grants for the project. Um, so if you have an idea in mind that meets our criteria, I would encourage you to still submit an application. And my contact info is on the screen if you'd like to discuss any project ideas or if you need uh, guidance during the application process. So thank you for allowing me the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about the Direct Support Fund, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Perfect. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for that. Um, you know, as we all know, support fund is really so important and, and needed for so many smaller grassroots groups that we know are doing really essential work but can have difficulty in finding the funding to continue their work. Um, again, just to reiterate, if you are interested in applying for direct support, please make sure to sign up as a leader and help the harm and get in touch with Stephanie directly as soon as possible with the deadline so close. Um, just a reminder before we get to our next speaker, if you have any questions, please submit them using the control panel on your screen and we'll get to as many of them as possible following the speaker presentations. And with that, um, I want to hand it off to our next speaker, who is Bridget Shields. She is the founding member and outreach organizer at Friends of the Harmed, and she's going to be speaking on shale field stories. Hi, everybody. This is Bridget Shields. I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And I want to have a special thanks to Halt the Harm Network for providing this time for us to tell all of you what's been going on in the shale fields of Pennsylvania, and um, thanks to Karen Faridan and the local stand, which she'll be telling you more about, and a special thanks to the Mountain Watershed Association, who has been instrumental in helping us get a grant to publish our second volume of Shalefield Stories, which will be out very soon. What we started to do with Shalefield Stories was give an opportunity to people who have been harmed in the shale fields in Pennsylvania to tell their story. We found that many of these people for the past five years, going on six now, have been harmed by fracking and they've been abandoned by our government and by the industry. So through Shalefield Stories, we started to compile um, a publication of their stories around the country because we found out wherever fracking is being done, the harms are consistent. This next publication that will be coming out next month is dedicated to the memory of Terry Greenwood. He was one of the first people that I personally met who was harmed by the industry and he spent most of his days talking about what the industry did to him and his family and his neighbors in Washington County, PA. He got sick in March of 2014, and he passed away three months later from numerous brain tumors. So our next publication will be, in his memory, his story you can find in this edition. This is just a slide of what the rural area in Pennsylvania was looking like with fracking on regular farmland in the rural areas of PA, and this is where most of the people that we have been helping live. But now we found out that the industry is moving into more of our urban areas and we've had major water contamination issues both in the rural areas and now in the more populated areas. I'm sorry this isn't a very clear slide but this is on top of a reservoir that is a drinking water supply of 300,000 people and on top of this reservoir you can vaguely see there are numerous wells and fracking pits and we've been very concerned about the water quality and there have been issues that it doesn't seem that the DEP is addressing right now so we're very concerned about that. Moving into the more rural or urban areas you can see that we're exposing our children to the harms of fracking both through air and water contamination. This is a slide of children waiting for their school bus and having to wade through lines and lines of truck traffic. This next slide is children 
playing on the school playground and in the back here you can see the flaring from a well that is way too close to the school. Right now in Pennsylvania we're experiencing the problem of the industry moving closer and actually now schools that have been having a hard time with um, funding education are now considering leasing their land to the drillers and there are um, leases on school property that we're very concerned about. Water contamination is one of our biggest problems and methane migration has not only made it in through the tap water of many individuals but you can see here it's migrated to the point where people can light their streams on fire. This is a family that we've helped down in Washington County. So a little bit about water contamination and what Shellfield Stories does. Through distributing our book, we ask for donations of $5 per copy. With that, 100% of the proceeds after printing costs, which is very minimal, we put the funds towards helping people by providing water. This is one of the examples of the water that the DEP has told this family that was safe to drink. We have helped probably now close to 60 families with drinking water problems. So as you can see, it's not just an issue of the water that comes out of their tap, but the water that comes out of their tap is not even safe for bathing. So we do, um, like the local stand does, we hold little fundraising events and we bring in water that is just for drinking. And this is an area up in Butler County called the Woodlands where over 40 families have lost their water. We were able to help put in a water buffalo, but that water is only used for bathing and cleaning. This is one example of a water buffalo that we put in in Washington County to help three families. And what people don't understand about this is once your water is contaminated, a water buffalo can only be used for bathing or cleaning. It's not potable water for drinking because the buffaloes are made out of plastic which le leaches. But when your water is contaminated, the pipes through which your water runs are contaminated and that means also your water heater, your washer, your dishwasher if you have one, your refrigerator if it runs through there. So not only do you have to replace um, the water that comes through your tap, but all the pipes and anything that the water ran through. So it becomes a very, very expensive process and something that we're unable to do and sustain. So what we do now is just help people fill their water buffaloes. Air quality is also a very serious problem in our area. Like you saw on the last slide where kids are playing n near their schools, this is in Washington County. This was in 2013. And this is um, a cryogenic plant that was put up and constantly has been having these, what the industry calls little hiccups with their um, equipment. The people living in this area have to go inside. They can't let their kids outside to play. And the water or the air is very toxic. and very hard to breathe. These are the areas where you hear reports of people getting headaches, nausea, sore throats, nosebleeds, and it's consistent wherever drilling and these kind of facilities and infrastructure are popping up. So another thing that we do is help people by providing air scrubbers for their home. This is a family down in Washington County that we were able to put an air scrubber in the woman in the middle, her name is Mima. She's 90 years old. They're low income, as a lot of many of the families are that we help. And the air was so toxic in her area that she was having a hard time breathing even in her home. So air scrubbers are a way of keeping the air safe inside the home for the families who are having a lot of difficulty, especially children with asthma or senior citizens that are, have breathing problems the air scrubbers that we provide for them is a way of helping them to be able to stay in their home and deal with the situation. Another thing that we help do is provide, um, uh, 
I can't think of what this is right now. Um, you all know what that is. I'm sorry, I'm having a, a brain freeze. But this is another reason why people, when they're driving home and trying to get to their home, respirator. Sorry, that's what they need. So respirators are often needed for families who, believe it or not, try to get from their car to their home where the air scrubbers are. The air um, is so toxic that another thing that we help them with through donations is providing air and water testing. So Shellfield Stories has been very beneficial in educating the public and also our legislators on what this industry has been doing to the people in Pennsylvania. We've been able to help people living in the areas that have been harmed by giving them a voice to at least tell others about the problems that they're having. We've collaborated with faith communities, public health researchers, environmental organizations, social justice groups, and help provide support to individuals and mostly in western Pennsylvania. All the donations that we collect from distributing the book help provide this assistance and we're all volunteers that work on this issue. And it's been through the help of Local Stand, Mountain Watershed, and the Halt the Harm Network that we've been able to continue this crusade as we call ourselves the Red Cross of Fracking, mostly in western Pennsylvania and hopefully our model will be able to be helpful in other areas of the country where people are experiencing the same things. So if you're interested in finding out more about Shellfield Stories or requesting a copy of the new publication that will com be coming out, our website is shellfieldstories.org and you can also write to us at the addresses that you find here. We have a phone number where you can call and request your copy. In the last year alone, Shellfield Stories has distributed over 5,000 copies of our publication throughout the United States, England, and Australia. We've been able, through the donations of our book, to provide $15,000 worth of aid in the form of air scrubbers, water fills for water buffaloes, bottled water, air and water monitoring, and we found that sometimes in these areas we are the only people that these harmed victims can rely on. So unfortunately, the need keeps growing. The more permits that are permitted for fracking, the closer that they're getting to our more populated communities, we're finding out that the need is greater. So we thank you all so much for taking part in this webinar and being interested in how we can help the people in the shale fields and hope that you'll pick up a copy of our new edition when it comes out in July. So thank you all so much for listening today and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bridget. Um, as Bridget showed us, it's really hard to deny the power of a, a true and moving story. Um, and stories are really integral ammo for, for the movement to protect our communities against fracking's harms. Um, and as Bridget mentioned, you know, uh, today's speakers are all doing great work in Pennsylvania and these initiatives are only being implemented currently in Pennsylvania. However, you know, she did make a really great point that all of these projects are replicable and, you know, like we all know fracking has been impacting and negatively impacting communities across the country, not just in Pennsylvania. So, you know, we're definitely um, interested in talking to anyone if anyone's interested in finding out a way to replicate these projects and and um, you know we'll definitely love to be interested in, in supporting you and if you're interested in that so definitely if you're from outside of Pennsylvania and if this is something that um, you'd like to see in your community um, make sure to contact us and, and we'd be happy to chat. Next we have Karen Faraden. Um, Karen is from Burke's Gas Truth and we'll be speaking about a unique initiative called Local Stand. 
Thank you so much, and I want to thank Bridget and Stephanie. It's really an honor to be able to collaborate with people like them, and I want to thank everybody for being on the call today, and especially thank the Halt Harm Network for hosting all of this and getting these projects um, the great attention that they deserve. I wanted to um, start by talking to you about our project, Local Stand, and I hope you're seeing it on the screen. I'm having a little bit of a malfunction on my side. But um, I wanted to, before I get into my remarks, I wanted to point out that um, it's because of exactly what Bridget was just describing that we uh, want to expand local stand out beyond what I'll describe as was our original intention for it because there are so many families in need uh, as you can see on our splash screen I hope um, that it was intended to be a water drive or a water campaign but as Bridget correctly pointed out there's so many people who need air scrubbers and respirators that you know there are tremendous needs beyond simply water. But I'll, I'll explain now how it is that we got into local stand and how we chose to concentrate on water. But I'll start by telling you a little bit about um, a little background. Uh, my organization, Berks Gas Truth, coordinated a statewide effort back uh, in 2013 to get the Pennsylvania Democratic Party's state committee to support a moratorium statewide on fracking. Uh, one of the members has was presenting a resolution to the committee and we knew that that was coming up and so we had decided to take on uh, that task as uh, one of our interesting targets. I'll explain what that is in a second but what we had decided to do was to go after the state committee as an interesting target that we could use to help advance the story of the need for not only moratorium on fracking but the interest that the Democratic Party in the rank and file part of the party actually has for supporting something like that. And so um, we went to the state committee after organizing around somebody's dining room table um, in between, um, after having our initial meeting where we set up our plans for how we were going to carry out our campaign, we started holding statewide calls. And that's why I'm really bringing this up, because it was the statewide calls that was the genesis of what became Local Stand. We succeeded in a month's time between that first meeting at the dining room table and all the statewide calls and um, the actual meeting where we didn't expect to win, but we did. The state committee voted 59% to 41% to support a statewide moratorium on fracking. We thought we were in for a much longer campaign, but we actually got it done in a month's time, and that led to a lot of excitement among the people who were in for a longer campaign. They said, what's next? So going back to this notion at the top of the screen of interesting targets and creative actions, it, be, it was something that had become my own mantra right before all of this happened. I was getting very frustrated with the number of rallies that we were having in Harris all the time where the press wasn't even covering them and the target certainly didn't care that we were you know down in the rotunda making fun of them and so uh, I thought there has to be something better to do and I thought well for a number of reasons we needed to start kind of mixing things up a bit and coming up with targets that weren't used to being targets and actions that might actually capture some attention because they were so creative. So the first thing we did was pick the interesting target of the Pennsylvania Democratic State Committee because frankly a lot of the people uh, who got involved in the action and were lobbying those people didn't even know that they had state committee members. So the state committee members are people who aren't used to being targeted and so for them it was almost flattering sometimes and that helped us a lot and so um, it was a, a great sort of approach to go after a group that's not used to being targeted. But after that we thought What's next? Let's do a creative action. And so using the same kind of uh, techniques of uh, having these conference calls that were statewide where people could jump on, anybody who was interested in learning more about it could get on the calls, we came up with collaboratively a project we decided to call Local Stand. So the Local Stand idea was simple. We wanted to shame the industry and the government for turning their backs on Pennsylvanians whose water had been contaminated by drilling by holding what I used to call pathetic fundraising events, but somebody who got involved with us had the much more uh, civilized term humble fundraising events, like bake sales and yard sales, in order to say this is what it has come to in Pennsylvania. We have to hold bake sales in order to raise money so that Pennsylvanians can have clean water in their homes. And so we decided to focus in on that water issue in part because it was such a big issue for so many of us. A lot of us were drawn into this movement by our concerns over water and what it was doing to the water supply in general and certainly what it was doing to individual families. But it was also very timely because the story had just broke that um, 161 
private water supplies had been contaminated by fracking according to the DEP's own records, and we know that that's just the tip of the iceberg, but finally it was documented that 161 wells, not families, multiple families can rely on a well, so it was 161 wells that had been contaminated by fracking. So we thought, let's concentrate on water. In this case, we had very you know, common targets, the industry and the government, so it was really the action that was going to be the thing. And so we came up with this idea again of having these very small, humble, events to really juxtapose what we were doing against what the industry was doing and the government that was holding the industry accountable. But what we discovered along the way after trying to make that point, so it was really sort of a shaming <laughs> effort that we were engaged in, but what we dis got, discovered that there were lots of unintended benefits to local STEM. Uh, so I'm just going to run through what we found out were the uh, benefits that we hadn't really thought about going in, so we can't take credit for all of the benefits, but we certainly discovered them as soon as we got started. First is that when you position something as charity and not activism, it's a lot harder for people to argue with you. And I'll give the example of tabling events that we've done. We've been fortunate to work with an organization called the Guacamole Fund to set up tables at concerts by Bonnie Raitt, Jackson Brown, and Crosby, Stills, and Nash. So we're out in the lobby when those concerts are going on, if they come anywhere near our area, we're able to hand out literature, talk to people, get them to sign up for our mailing list and so forth. Um, Whenever we go to an event like that, uh, we run the risk of getting into arguments with people, and the one that stands out in my mind is at the Crosby, Stills & Nash concert, which was at the Sands Casino in Bethlehem, of all places. There were two men at different times over the course of the evening who missed significant portions of the concert to stand out in the lobby and yell at us about fracking. When you do a local stand and you're positioning it as charity and you're saying, this isn't debatable, this is happening, people stop arguing. They might not stop at your stand, they might crumble a little bit, but they don't stand there and argue with you. And so it's very interesting to see the different kind of reaction that you get. And that kind of ties into the second um, one that I have here on the list, push versus pull. That comes out of old internet <laughs> thinking about how to deliver content to people. A website is a pull. You want people to come visit your website. But a push is a way of getting information in front of people's eyes in a place where they spend time. Social networking has everything to do with push technology. So there's email. So if you can deliver your newsletter to somebody's email address, that's a push. And so the real life corollary of that is asking people to come to my Burke's Gas Truth meeting, let's say, as opposed to my going to their meeting. The beauty of local stand is that we are going to their space, the, the space of the people who don't typically listen to us, people who would never come to a Brooks Gas Truth meeting or a screening of Gasland or any of that. A push is going out to the community. And so in this case, because we were doing these small charity events, we were in places like you know, farmer's markets and yard sales and any other place like that where we weren't expected to be seen typically, where we're meeting people who we would never encounter otherwise. And that is tremendously valuable when you're trying to get your message outside of the so-called bubble. We preach to the choir a lot. This is a way of getting outside of that bubble. Um, anyone can do one of these local stands. So, you know, you can be affiliated with one of the organizations that works on uh, the issues in the state, but you don't have to be one of those people. You can be somebody who's completely unaffiliated but just wants to help. And so that's one of the benefits, too, because this is pretty much um, a kit. This is fractivism in a kit so that you can take all the materials that you need and just go, as long as you know how to put together an event of some sort, you can do one. And there's no expertise required. Um, one of the things that happens to me an awful lot is that people tell me, uh, oh, I just saw this article in the newspaper today. You need to write a letter to the editor about it. And I always push back, oh, you need to write a letter to the editor. But their response to me is always, well, actually, um, I don't know enough of the facts to be able to counter whatever the claims that they're making in this article are. The beauty of local stand is that you really don't need to have that kind of expertise. It's helpful to have some facts on hand, but you don't need to really know anything because we provide materials so that you can hand out something without having to actually know it. And that takes a lot of the pressure off of people and it opens this up as an opportunity to a lot of people who might feel uncomfortable otherwise. And even for those people who don't feel comfortable even doing something like a bake sale. Um, we discovered that some people felt comfortable taking a jar, for instance, to a local sandwich shop or a small boutique and having it 
placed on the counter. We've all seen those, I'm sure, um, where we see something on a counter where somebody's lost their home to a fire or they were under, going through some terrible illness and so there's a collection jar. Basically, that's something that people have done as part of a local stand campaign and it's perfectly fine and that way you're not required to answer any questions. So it's, it's uh, you know, something that's open to anyone, no matter how much you know about fracking. You can keep it simple or don't. Um, again, you could put a jar on the counter at a local restaurant, but you could also do something elaborate like a car wash or something a lot harder. Uh, one fellow that we were talking to, it hadn't come to fruition yet, I'm still hoping it does, he had the idea for the old UNICEF Halloween boxes that you, I think you have to be of a certain age to recall, but there used to be these Halloween boxes that we would take around with us as trick-or-treaters when we were kids, and then we, as you'd go door to door, people would make small donations to UNICEF. He thought about having a local stand equivalent of that. So, you know, you can be as creative as you'd like to be. Another benefit is that you get past news editors. One of the problems for a lot of us in this part of the state for sure, and I think it's pretty much a statewide problem, is that news editors don't always cover our issues very well at all, if at all. Um, and so, First of all, when you're advertising your local stand, you can certainly put it on community calendars, and so you're already in the paper that way. But the other thing that we encouraged our hosts to do was to um, write up, or we would write it for them, but a basic press release, um, basically not even a press release, but more of an actual story, and take a nice photo of your local stand and submit it to editors to try to get it published, because editors are all stretched very thin these days. So if you can provide them with content that they don't have to really do much with, you have a much better chance of getting published. And so we actually got published here in my area, others did too. Um, and so it's one way of getting past the news editors, getting your story in and again, because it's being presented it as a charitable effort, you don't get as much pushback. And then the endless possibilities. Uh, it's not just a matter of being creative about what your local stand is, but what your local stand is for. So for instance, of course, right now we're interested in raising funds, whereas we started out being interested in making more of a political point, uh, but you can still use it for other purposes. So for instance, in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, there's a legislator, a state senator called um, Patrick Brown, and because of his last name being Brown, and because we were trying to pressure him to support a statewide moratorium bill, um, folks out there had a brownie sale. And so you can you can do all sorts of things with it. The one thing I am still very eager to do is to have a local stand at the governor's church. I think that would just be <laughs> really fun. But anyhow, you can think about any kind of a, you know, effort that you'd like you know, to put forward to make a point or just to help in, in a way that you can raise lots of funds to help just buy water and air monitors, air scrubbers for people. Pardon me. I think I hit the wrong thing there. So I just wanted to show you some examples of some of the local stands. Up in the upper right-hand corner is our kickoff event. It was a concert that we held. It was the second Frackapalooza concert that we had held in our area. We decided to um, host it um, as the kickoff event for local stand because we had just made our plans prior to this event coming up anyhow, so we thought it would be a perfect kickoff event. Uh, so that's one way where it was simply an opportunity for people to, you know, to make donations that evening. But more typically, it was something like you're seeing in the center of the screen where you see us all standing, well, I'm taking that photo in the center, but you see our team uh, at our bake sale in Kutztown, Pennsylvania, and right beneath it you see a long shot of what the table looks like. It was very important when you're doing something like a yard sale to make it as appealing as possible to have lots of baked goods because that's what's going to stop people. They're going to stop to look at what you're selling. You get to talk to them about local stand and hand them the flyer as a result of them stopping, but you need to make them stop. So we tried to have as appealing a presentation as possible. In the lower right you see another one of our uh, big sales. But then on the left you see one of our more <laughs> interesting events. This was in Philadelphia, the industry was meeting there regularly. They had stopped now, but um, they had a, an event every year in the fall called Shale Gas Insights, and we would hold a counter event called Shale Gas Outrage, and sometimes it was a rally, but this last time that we held it in 2013, um, after that the industry stopped meeting in Philadelphia, but at their last event in 2013, we set up a water drive right across the street from the convention center where they were meeting and spending 
tens of thousands of dollars every day. Outside, people were across the street at a church dropping off bottles of water so that people in Pennsylvania could have clean water in their homes. And so we could really make that point, that juxtaposition in that event. Uh, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner, again, we were following all of the conventions of charitable events. So you see the very familiar thermometer as we would get more donations because some people were just handing out you know, money. Um, so we would keep adding to our thermometer uh, of how much uh, funds we had received that day. And so we had set all of this up because we are very grassroots that uh, through an organization that was willing to be our fiscal sponsor so that we could direct all of the donations that we received into a registered 501c3 account that could be dispersed equitably. And so that was part of what it took to host a local stand. We might want to make it as simple as possible for you. So if you're, for instance, in a community where you're trying to raise money to help your neighbors because you're in an impacted part of the state, it was perfectly fine if you wanted to hang on to your you know, funds raised and turn it right over to your neighbors to help them get their water buffalo or fill it. But if you were in another part of the state and you just wanted to contribute, you didn't have to worry about where the funds were going to go. We would take care of that for you. And that was the idea behind it. We wanted to make it as simple as possible for our, all of our hosts. So not only did we have that set up, but we also provided all the materials that you could possibly need, the customizable flyers to put around your community, handouts that you would actually hand out to each customer with an opportunity on the back of the handout to donate more if they got this, you know, flyer when they were out of the bag when they got home. They could see that there was a way that they could go online and donate even more money. Uh, customizable press releases, a logo uh, that you could use for a sign, you could use for stickers. Um, the other thing we pr provided with people was a letter that gave all that information about the 501c3 so that if you went to a local restaurant or a flea market or a farmer's market and you wanted to sit, put a jar there or you wanted to set up a stand, uh, you know, you were given the credibility of having this letter to say, no, I'm not just some person who's coming here on my own to raise money and then keep it. I'm actually connected with something that's real. And so, you know, we gave legitimacy to people by you know, providing them that letter. Uh, so we gave them everything we could possibly do. If they needed something that we didn't provide, we provided it. We created it for them. And so the good news is that Halt the Harm Network is planning on providing a very similar kit for individuals and groups interested in hosting local stand events, and you'll be hearing more about that in a bit, but I just wanted to thank you again for listening to all of this, and I'm more than happy to answer your questions uh, if you have any about how Local Stand works or about our organization. It's for Gas Truth, gastruth.org, and if you go there now, forgive me, I need to do some updating, but you will find information about Local Stand there. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you so much for listening. Great, thank you so much, Karen. Um, lots of information and lots of great stuff on Local Stand. And um, for those of you interested in hosting your own Local Stand, um, like Karen mentioned, you're totally in luck. We are launching Local Stand service very soon at the end of this month, actually. And, and to make it really easy and accessible for anyone interested in holding their own Local Stand to get the support and resources needed um, from uh, resources and FAQ sheets to signs um, to best practices and other ideas. Um, so, for our pilot phase, excuse me, we'll be offering this service to those only in Pennsylvania. Um, however, we are hoping to expand to other states if there is a demand. So, even if you don't live in Pennsylvania, don't hesitate to contact us. You know, we're um, more than happy to chat with those who are from out of, uh, from in other states um, that are dealing with fracking um, to explore options to get local stand in your state. So, now we'll just move on to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Um, Let's see, our first question we have, um, this one is for Stephanie, um, and it's about the direct support fund. We have a question that is asking, how likely is it that you will receive additional funds for the direct support fund? Thanks, it's a really great question. And um, so our grant requests are already out there. We are pretty much just waiting on word from our funders. And I think um, it's really just important to mention that we were able to demonstrate to our funders that there is, you know, such a large need, a large need for, for funding to support, you know, frontline communities and their um, their grassroots efforts. So we're really hopeful uh, that our funders will be willing to continue this project. 
but at this point, you know, that's that's about as as certain as it gets, um, and we're hoping to know maybe within the next month or two, um, you know, whether we'll be able to continue that into the future. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. And so, I mean, if there's anyone on this call or, excuse me, this webinar who is interested in Direct Support Fund, um, please, you know, do uh, contact us and, and sign up to be a leader so that you can directly talk to Stephanie about receiving those additional funds or at least applying to receive those additional funds if they do uh, become available. So our next question that we have is for Karen um, about local stands. The question is, um, I think I may want to host a local stand, but would find it useful to have some facts on hand. Is there a fact sheet in the materials you provide? Uh, it's a very good question because, as I said a moment ago, um, we did hear from people now and then that they would require something more. Um, and so we were always happy to provide information to people, um, you know, whatever additional materials that they needed. But certainly I do think it is probably helpful to have a fact sheet on hand. So I think that um, one of the things we'd like to create through Health to Harm is exactly something like that. So maybe some of the top ten talking points or something that you have at your disposal. Great. Yeah, I mean, I think just to add on to that, there there might be people who want to host a local stand that may not be very necessarily familiar with the issue, but just want to help out. And so I think an FAQ or um, a fact sheet would be really, really helpful. Great. Um, and so we have another question um, for Bridget. Um, this is These are two separate questions, but um, I'll go with the first one. The first question is, um, when will version 2 or the second edition of Shalefield Stories be available? And then the second question is uh, are more specific. How many people are living without um, drinking water, clean drinking water in Pennsylvania right now? Those are um, two great questions. Thank you. And the volume 2 is hopefully at the printer as we speak. We've been working um, really hard all weekend to try to get the last of the edits in. One of the problems that we faced this year with this publication was a lot of the first-hand testimonies that we had ready to go, people entered into lawsuits. And the last thing we want to do is to make their life more difficult or to do anything that would harm them even greater. So we had to pull some of the stories and and get new ones. So. That's been a big obstacle in getting the new book out. So hopefully by July 1st, um, we'll be putting out a notice that the new book is available. And the second question, DEP has um, said that there were 200, I think it was now up to 46, that they have water wells that have been contaminated. and. None of those on that list, because we've done um, file reviews, are the people that we help. So we know there are probably hundreds more families that are living without potable water in Pennsylvania, which to me was probably the most horrendous thing that I've heard and why I got active in this movement. Um, Pittsburgh was one of the first cities to ban fracking, and I live in the city of Pittsburgh. But I knew a lot of people that were living in the rural areas that were living without water. And it's just hard to believe that here it is, 2015, and we have families that have water that is so toxic they can't even bathe in it. So there are many, many hundreds of families living without potable water in Pennsylvania. And we really don't have an absolute count of how many, but we know even one is too many. But there are hundreds right now. Great. Thanks, Bridget. And also, just to follow up about Shalefield Stories, um, you know, is there an online version? And what about, is there a bulk, is there an option for bulk discounts for nonprofits? Yes. On our website, www.shalefieldstories.org, there is price listing there for people who want to order copies in bulk. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we offer to other grassroots organizations that need to spread the word about the harms of fracking, you can go to our website and you can order um, books at a discounted rate. And you can use them either to 
work with Help the Harmed or local stand, or you're more than free to use them as a fundraising um, tool for your own organization. Depending on how many copies you order is um, how the discounted rates go, but if you were able to get them at, say, $3 per copy and you want to sell them for 5 or ask for a, a bigger donation, you're more than welcome to do that and use the funds to help your organization get started. So we want to try to make this available not only to educate the public and legislators, but also to use it as a tool for other grassroots organizations to use as a fundraising tool. Great. Thank you, Bridget. Um, mm -hmm. Our next question is for Karen. Um, a little bit more about Local Stand and the unique way that it serves as a fundraising tool, but also as an educational and awareness piece. Um, someone has asked, to what extent has Local Stand served as an educational tactic that opens a conversation about why people need replacement water? That's a really good question. That was exactly our intent when we started holding local stands was to get the word out um, in sort of a less than heavy handed way so that again we were positioning it as a charitable event with the intent of raising funds of course, but it was almost secondary when we started to being able to talk to people who don't usually hear our message about the fact that this is happening. And so we're certainly delivering the message a lot, but I am happy to say that we frequently did get into conversations with people where we did talk about the issues in a more involved way. We even picked up some additional helpers as a result. Um, and so, um, you know, we had somebody else host the stand as a result of having talked to us, and we got an offer for an additional stand because we were talking to the people who ran the local farmer's market, so they gave us a stand the following week and, you know, for free. And it was just a great uh, experience all the way around to really not just uh, – again, deliver the message about what's happening, but to give people a lot more detail. We were very careful, though, to not have handouts, to, like typical articles or things that we had written up. We had a simple flyer on the table that would go to every person who stopped by or every, you know, we'd put one in every bag with the cupcakes we were selling. Um, but we didn't want to have a ton of articles and scientific studies and all those things that we would have at a tabling event because it was definitely not activism. So we didn't want to come across as people who were there just to make a point. We wanted to do it, again, in this sort of softer way to draw more people in, and it was very effective. So I think that's where the first questioner had asked about a fact sheet. That's where that can be extremely helpful in getting into a little bit more detail about um, what the issues are. Great. Um, the next question is for both Bridget and Stephanie, so um, you guys can both answer this question. Um, someone asked, can you say a bit more about air and water monitoring available through your organizations? I'll let you go first, Stephanie. Okay. So uh, Mountain Watershed, we frequently partner with um, groups like uh, the Alliance, for Aquatic Resource Monitoring um, and Southwest PA Environmental Health Project. So when I mentioned, you know, that through our Marcellus Citizen Stewardship Project, we help organize residents and building capacity by offering these activities, it's mostly that we, you know, we partner with groups who we know are doing um, and providing those services to residents just to try and connect them uh, with those resources. Now, of course, as a you know, watershed organization, we do our own um, water quality monitoring in the area, but we also, if citizens want to do uh, monitoring on their own, we try to um, help put them into contact with you know, those groups who offer the types of training. And um, to elaborate on that a little bit, this is Bridget again with Shellfield Stories. We also um, try to help people, it's like as a need, as needed basis. We also work with um, Southwestern Environmental Health Network and Mountain Watershed, the Protect Our Children campaign. And when we find that there are families that are really in need of testing and can't afford it, if we have the funds available, we try to provide um, air monitoring or water tests for them. We work with our own lab and we have our own field people that go in and sit down with the families and 
sort of do a vetting process to see where the greatest needs are. Sometimes they think they might need water testing when actually what they need is maybe air monitoring that's more important. And depending on the funds that we have available to us, depend on what we're able to provide them with. Great. Thank you so much, Bridget and Stephanie. Um, mm -hmm. So we have one last wrap-up question, and this is for everyone. Um, it is, I, um, this is from someone who said, I'm an academic researcher. How can universities and colleges help? Have you had any partnerships that have been helpful with scholars? Ooh, I can <laughs> I can jump in here in terms of the uh, local stand campaign. Um, one of the things that local stand morphed into uh, was something called the clean water mob at Power Shift in Pittsburgh a couple years ago, and um, it's a really great tool for you know environmental organizations on campus or just you know any student on campus that is interested in doing something to help uh, the cause. This is a, a great way in um, because we, uh, you know, we can totally see how uh, campus groups would be able to educate their fellow classmates. Frankly, you know, this generation is inheriting this mess, and so being able to get the word out and talk about what's actually happening in Pennsylvania or any other place where this is going on is really, really important. And college campuses are a great place to do that. So I would encourage anybody uh, who wants to to work with student groups. And this is Bridget. Um, in the new edition of Shellfield Stories, we were able to get interns from the Thomas Merton Center, which is our fiscal sponsor um, for our 5013C. And we have a college student from Duquesne University, Anna, who did an article for the new edition that is a fracking 101, which describes and shows every aspect of this process from fracking all the way to pipelines and frac sand mining. So we've been very fortunate to have interns from different universities come and offer to help us with our publication and also out in the field. So we encourage any students to, yeah, please get in touch with us if you are interested in helping us with our campaigns. We would be more than happy to have you come on board. And to follow up on that, you know, this is um, Stephanie with Mountain Watershed. And I would just say um, through direct support, you know, we are not limiting um, who those funds can go out to. So if we have students who are interested in doing uh, research around, um, say, the impacts of fracking or the community impacts of fracking, um, that's definitely a sort of proposal. Those are the out-of-the-box thinking type of proposals that we really want to see. Um, so not limiting it to like 501c3 organizations, um, really anyone who wants to um, get involved in their community and, and do those types of outreach projects, we want to hear from you uh, through direct support. Those are exactly you know, what we're looking to find. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have left today for questions. Um, I'd just like to, once again, express our thanks to our leaders, Stephanie, Brooke, and Karen, for sharing with us the work they're doing. And, um, and I'd like to thank all of you for taking an hour out of your day to learn about what you can do to halt fracking's harms. Again, I um, just want to remind you by signing up for this webinar, you will receive an invite to apply as a leader. So look out for that, uh, an email from us in your inbox soon. Um, to take advantage of these services, um, or to get connected with today's leaders, we really highly recommend you to apply as a leader. Um, and so thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you all at our next webinar. Stay tuned. Thank you again.